This time I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remark remarks and have any written statements uh, be made part of the record and without objection that is so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent the chair be authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any point and without objection that is ordered. Today's hearing represents both a culmination and a continuation. First, this is a culmination of the admirable work performed by Inspector General Michael Bolton and his team regarding the U.S. Capitol Police Department's preparation for and response to the January 6th Capitol attack. The focus of today's hearing is the final four flash reports in the series of eight flash reports released by Inspector General Bolton. All eight of these flash reports uh, reveal systematic deficiencies throughout the U.S. Capitol uh, Police Department and the areas of training, planning, policies, and procedures, intelligence, communication, and leadership, and culture. Three of the, la of the four flash reports that are the focus of today's hearing reveal these same deficiencies across the Department's Command and Coordination Bureau, Hazardous Incident Response Division and Canine Unit, and Dignitary Protection Division. In these flash reports, we learn of a general lack of coordination and communication between these units and the department's operational leadership. Outdated and in some cases non-existent emergency management policies and procedures and a lack of personnel and equipment that made it difficult for these units to accomplish their missions. We also learn of the frustration officers within the department feel with a lack of direction from the department's chain of command a lack, lack of preparedness, and a lack of confidence in the department's command and control system, among other things. The final flash report in this series is a comprehensive review of the department's progress in implementing the recommendations put forth in the seven previous flash reports and the 1-6 Task Force Capital Security Review. From this flash report, we learn the department has only implemented 29% of the recommendations made by the Department uh, Inspector General and only a portion of those made by the 1-6 Task Force. In addition to being a culmination of the Inspector General's first phase of work on this topic, this hear hearing is also a continuation. The Inspector General and his team will continue their work honing in to focus and follow up on issues their flash reports have revealed. Likewise, this committee will continue its oversight of the Capitol Police and its performance in response to the catastrophic and traumatic events of January 6th. This hearing will be the sixth that this committee has held directly related to January 6th, and that does not include the oversight hearing we held on the Capitol Police Board. This hearing offers a, an opportunity to not only consider where we go from here, but to reflect upon the falsehoods and dangerous rhetoric, rhetoric that brought us here in the first place. We can't forget that what we saw on January 6th was a, a started by a lie, a, a lie uh, from a disgruntled former president and repeated by many in the media and across the aisle that the safest and most secure election in American history was stolen and that, that its results were illegitimate. Motivated by that lie, violent insurrectionists wielding weapons and restraints stormed the Capitol, intending to do harm to, to those who work in this place and to disrupt, if not destroy, the democratic process. Yes, the focus of today's hearing is the U.S. Capitol Police and the many deficiencies that prevented the department from adequately planning for and responding to the violence that occurred on January 6th. It's impossible to overstate the importance of that discourse, and it's appropriate that this committee has taken the lead in facilitating that discourse. However, a fire cannot start without a spark, and we would be doing a disservice to ourselves and to the American people if we do not here and always acknowledge the spark that lit the fire we witnessed on January 6th. Uh, to be clear, as I've said at our previous hearings, although today's focus is on the performance of the Capitol Police before uh, and during the attack, the attack was motivated and carried out by others and our important and necessary review of the department's performance as an institution and its leadership does not diminish the courage and valor of the men and women who fought so bravely to defend the Capitol and the Constitution on that January 6th. More than 140 
Law enforcement officers were injured that day, many grievously. Some have not been able to return to full duty because of their injuries. We have a responsibility to those brave officers and to the public to conduct thorough oversight to ensure that they have the right training, the right equipment, and the right leadership to do their job safely and to re return to their families each day. With that, I would now like to recognize our ranking member, Mr. Davis, for any comments he may like to make. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks to our witnesses, Mr. Bolton and Mr. Schumann for joining us today. I look forward to continuing our past hearings discussions on the dire need for the increased transparency and accountability by Speaker Pelosi, the Capitol Police Board in leadership, and Capitol Security overall. <clears throat> Mr. Bolton, this week, you received a letter from Republican members of this committee addressing numerous concerns that members have that we have raised regarding practices and clear breaches of trust by Capitol Police leadership. The magnetometers outside of the chamber that serve no security purpose and address no known internal threat. The incident in November when officers entered a member's office, took photos of legislative planning materials and subsequently opened an investigation into that office's legislative work and others. Even beyond the increased scrutiny of members, Politico reported last month that the Capitol Police's Intelligence Division is now conducting extensive background checks on Americans visiting their representatives. Capitol Police's leadership and their response to these instances of gross misconduct and clear threats on American civil liberties, as well as the department leadership's, the department's leadership failure to implement the majority of the Inspector General's recommendations, have done little to rebuild trust within the congressional community. It's imperative that the Inspector General's office continue to investigate the intelligence failures in the in the buildup to January 6th. <clears throat> Excuse me. Over the past year, it's become clear that Democratic leadership has abdicated its security oversight responsibilities, choosing not to learn lessons from the 1998 attack, the tragic 2011 shooting in Arizona, or the attack on my friends and I at a baseball field down the road from here in 2017. Mr. Bolton's office has made numerous recommendations to Capitol Police leadership to improve the security posture at the Capitol. It is imperative that the full number of security recommendations be implemented quickly and with the cooperation of both Capitol Police leadership and the Capitol Police Board. Just today, the Government Accountability Office released a report on, a la on lack of security preparedness by Capitol Police leadership and the Capitol Police Board on January 6th, for which I asked unanimous consent to enter into the record, Madam Chair. Without objection. The GAO found that the U.S. Capitol Police's planning for January 6, 2021 did not reflect the potential for extreme violence aimed at the Capitol and did not include contingencies for support from other agencies. Of course, the Republican members of this committee have been driving home this point for over a year now. Why was the Capitol security apparatus so unprepared? Part of the answer to that question is also addressed by the GAO, which explains that the Capitol Police Board oversees the Capitol Police. As we know, the Capitol Police Board is made up of political appointees, answerable to congressional leadership, including Speaker Pelosi. No matter how many times she tries to duck re her responsibility in the press, GAO's report tells us that while the Capitol Police makes security recommendations, it does not have the authority to implement them without board approval. And the board has no process in place to do review and approve such recommendations. The GAO concludes, without a comprehensive documented process to assess and mitigate risks, there is no assurance that the Capitol Police and the board are not overlooking potential security risks. In other words, even after decades of attacks, the Capitol is no better prepared today than it was on January 6. And that failure rests squarely on the shoulders of Speaker Pelosi, Capitol Police leadership, and the Capitol Police Board. I am thankful that the chair has called out this important called this important hearing because Americans and members alike deserve answers. And I hope today provides an opportunity for Mr. Bolton to give assurances that his office will investigate these matters vigorously. Our men and women who are in the Capitol Police. They place their lives on the line every day as the protectors of Congress. Their mission is vital for Congress to continue functioning 
on behalf of the American people. But that mission is undermined when the leadership of the capital security apparatus chooses to enact policies that are potentially politically motivated or infringe on the civil liberties of those who work in and visit our nation's capital. Let me remind everyone on this call and on this hearing today that neither Mr. Loudermilk or I would likely be here alive without the brave Capitol Police officers who ran toward gunfire so that we could run away from gunfire. We owe those heroes our lives. It's the leadership that needs to be held accountable for the decisions that they have to follow and live with in their daily operations and their daily workday. I hope Mr. Bolton understands the gravity of the situation at hand, and I know he works directly for the Capitol Police Board, but Mr. Bolton, we hope you will commit to keeping all members of this committee informed of your investigations as they unfold. Madam Chair, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I just would, uh, before recognizing um, our Inspector Jill, would note for the record that on January 6th, uh, 2020, the Capitol Police Board was made up of the Sergeant at Arms of the House and Senate and the architect of the Capitol, the architect appointed by President Trump, uh, the sergeant in the Senate by Mitch McConnell and the sergeant in the House by John Boehner. Uh, and the leadership of the Senate was Mitch McConnell and of course, Speaker Pelosi in the House. I would now uh, have the immense uh, pleasure of introducing our witnesses. Inspector General Michael A. Bolton, of course, is no stranger to this committee, having testified before us several times about his office's uh, previous flash reports. Inspector General Bolton assumed this role in January of 2019. Prior to this role, he served as acting Inspector General and Assistant Inspector General for investigations beginning in August of 2006. We're grateful to Inspector Bolton for his presence here today and for his long career in public service. Inspector General Bolton is joined by Daniel Schumann of Demand Progress, an organization that advocates for government transparency, accountability, ethics, and reform. Among other topics, Mr. Schumann has studied and written about the U.S. Capitol Police for a number of years, including before the January 6th attack. He also created the First Branch Forecast, a website that contains in-depth research on Congress and produces a weekly newsletter. Uh, Mr. Schumann has testified before Congress several times, but this is the first time he's testifying before this committee, and we welcome him and thank him for his shared interest in improving the legislative branch. Um, I will remind the witnesses that their entire written statements will be made part of the record and that the record will remain open for at least uh, five additional days for material to be uh, submitted. We ask that you summarize uh, your testimony in about five minutes. And Inspector General Bolton, uh, it's my pleasure to recognize you first for your uh, testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair Loughran, Ranking Member Davis, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to appear before you, the Committee on House Administration, to discuss our review of events in regards to the Capitol Police Department operation programs policies that were in effect during January 6, 2021. I would like to extend my appreciation to the committee for holding this hearing and the important work that this committee continues to do to make the Capitol complex safe and secure. I would also like to take the time to extend and recognize the outstanding efforts and work done by my staff in the Office of Inspector General, through their collective efforts and skills, we have produced eight flash reports outlining areas of improvement for the department, resulting in 104 recommendations. Our last and final flash report is a summary of the status of the recommendations we have made and security improvements that the department has made since January 6. Although the department has addressed some of our recommendations and have made security improvements throughout the Capitol complex, much work still needs to be addressed in relation to training, intelligence, cultural change, and operational planning. We have issued that final flash report outlining the status of our recommendations. During my testimony with the Senate Rules Committee on December 7th of 2021, I stated that the department had closed 30 of my recommendations. Since that time, the department has closed an additional nine recommendations for a total of 39. 
During that, my last year, we have issued three additional flash reports, not including the final one. Those included areas of departments such as Command and Coordination Bureau, Hazardous Inc Incidents Response Division, K-9 Unit, and finally, Dignitary Protective Division and Human Capital. Our fifth flash report is designed to communicate deficiencies within the department's Command and Coordination Bureau. Additionally, to gain a perspective on department-wide command and control challenges, on January 6, we contacted 86 Capitol Police officers and completed interviews with 36 of them who agreed to be interviewed. We also reviewed 49 after action reports by the officers and employees that were completed. Based on our interviews with the officers and review of the action after action reports, we identified department wide command and control deficiencies related to information sharing chain of command directions, communication, preparedness, training, leadership development, emergency response procedures, and law enforcement coordination. Our sixth flash report was designed to communicate deficiencies within the department's hazardous incident response division and the K-9 unit. Deficiencies include a lack of adequate department guidance for both incident response division and the K-9. The department did not always comply with guidance related to canine operations or training, did not always ensure canine policies and procedures were up to date, a lack of canine related training or operational experience required for officials, and formal guidance for emergency procedures as well as inadequate hazardous device response guidance could have hampered the efficiency of the canine unit. Our seventh flash report was designed to communicate any deficiencies within the department's dignitary protective division and human capital. The Dignitary Protective Division contributed towards the department's mission through proper planning and successfully evacuating individuals under its protection during the events of January 6. However, DPD incurred authorization issues with staging at evacuation vehicles. Additionally, DPD's training program lacked a dedicated training staff, facilities, and weapon systems training integration. Capitol Police could not provide documentation supporting that it implemented a department-wide leave restrictions or cancellations, or that it issued department-wide messages for recalls to duty. Our eighth and final flash report is a summary of the status of 104 recommendations and security improvements made by the department. Although the department did make several changes updating their policy and procedures, additional training for CDU units and the hiring of a subject matter expert in the planning and coordination of a large events or high profile demonstrations, the department still has more work to achieve the goal of making the Capitol complex safe and secure. Out of the 200 security enhancements that the department has provided to the OIG, only 61 of those items have been have supporting documentation to support those enhancements that have occurred. Some other security enhancements the department has instituted has been additional intelligence briefings provided to the rank and file, as well as to the department leadership. Department still lacks an overall training infrastructure to meet the needs of the department, the level of intelligence gathering and expertise needed, and an overall cultural change needed to move the department into a protective agency, as opposed to a traditional police department. In conclusion, the department is comprised of extraordinary men and women who are dedicated to protecting our democracy, putting their own lives in harm's way, in order for Congress to exercise their constitutional duties in a safe and open manner. It is our duty to honor those officers who have given their lives, but also ensuring the safety for all those working and visiting the Capitol complex by making hard changes within the department. Finally, I would like to thank not only this committee, but the Senate Rules Committee and the Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack for their continuing support of my office and the work they have done in protecting democracy so that events such as January 6th never happen again. Thank you for this opportunity to appear before you today, and I'll be very happy to answer any questions the committee may have at this time. Thank you so much, Mr. Bolton. We'll now uh, ask Mr. Schumann uh, to give his testimony to us in about five minutes. Thank you. Chairperson Lofkin, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the Committee on House Administration, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Over the last 14 months, the Capitol Police Inspector General has provided its expert analysis of the Capitol Police's operations, programs, and policies in effect on January 6th. 
My intent is to draw your attention to two things not addressed in the IG's flash reports. First, the structural limitations that narrow and limit the scope of the IG's findings. And second, the structural flaws that undermine oversight of the Capitol Police itself. The Office of the Inspector General should be fully independent of the Capitol Police Chief and of the Capitol Police Board. It is not. The Capitol Police Board appoints the IG. The board includes the Capitol Police Chief as an ex officio member. The board exercises general oversight over the IG. The board is not subject to investigation by the IG, and the board operates in near total secrecy. Let me illustrate how this is a problem. The board, uh, the board reportedly has directed the Inspector General in a non-public letter to never publish IG reports. By comparison, it is routine practice for federal IGs to publish their reports because, that's, because this empowers accountability to Congress, civil society, and the public. The board reportedly acts unanimously, so any member can secretly block a change in policy that would permit the release of IG reports. In addition to full independence, the IG should be empowered to investigate the board and to publicly report its findings to members and to the public. We can only wonder whether there are pre-existing IG recommendations unheeded by the Capitol Police that could have made a difference on January 6th. Disclosure policies should go beyond IG reports. The Capitol Police should routinely disclose the agency's budget justifications, semi-annual statement of disbursements, arrest data, prosecution rate uh, for threats against members, Office of Professional Responsibility Discipline data, and minutes from its board meetings. In addition, there should be a civilian oversight board composed of stakeholders from across Capitol Hill. And there should be a process by which the public can request Capitol Police records. These structural limitations narrow the range of information available to the IG and to overseers and limit the IG's ability to make recommendations to you. Let me now address the structural limitations that undermine oversight of the Capitol Police. I say this, of course, right as my computer monitor has decided to stop functioning. Here we go. Sorry about that. Only a short while ago, the former acting Capitol Police Chief testified that she reported to leadership, not to the committees of jurisdiction. In addition, recently one member of the Capitol Police Board who was appointed by one cham chamber declined to testify in person and hearings conducted by the other. These examples illustrate a fundamental problem with the Capitol Police leadership. They do not fully respect the jurisdiction of the oversight committees. The GAO shared these concerns in its 2017 report. I wish I had, but I don't have a clever recommendation on how to address this problem. Certainly all members of the Capitol Police Board, should you choose to retain such a body, must routinely testify as a group before the Oversight and Appropriations Committees. Their understandings of their roles and duty to report must be adjusted accordingly. We recommend the hiring of full-time congressional staff with law enforcement expertise to help oversee the Capitol Police. Such personnel should be provided as committee staff to overseers and appropriators and funded out of the Capitol Police budget. The majority at House Admin already has implemented this recommendation. Each day increases the likelihood of another attack on the Capitol. And yet recent proposals made by the Capitol Police and members of its board regarding new security programs raise important civil liberties concerns without addressing the fundamental Capitol security questions. We are not comfortable with new surveillance activities without real reform at the top that is capable of keeping police activities within appropriate boundaries. Our government must be open to the people and safe for conducting the business of democracy. For that to happen, we must address the structural failures inherent in oversight of the Capitol Police. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schumann, and also uh, Inspector General Bolton. Uh, we appreciate your testimony. And now is the time when members can ask uh, their questions. I'll turn first to the ranking member, Mr. Uh, Davis, for uh, questions that he may have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my first question, Mr. Bolton, again, thanks for being here today. I want to start, <clears throat> excuse me, by thanking you and your team for the hard work you put into these reports. We have now had numerous hearings and meetings to speak about these reports, and your office has always been responsive to our questions and concerns. 
I want to ask you a few quick questions because we only have five minutes. So short answers or I'm going to ask to reclaim my time. Uh, in your testimony, you explain that you asked uh, over 80 officers to speak with your office about January 6th, but only about 36 of them have actually completed an interview. Now, these officers weren't obligated to speak with you, but would you consider that to be a normal response rate for an investigation? Uh, it, it, for, for police officers, I would say that's about a normal rate. They're under no obligation because they weren't a subject of an investigation. We were just soliciting their information. Some just may not have had the time to, uh, to be able to uh, speak with us or for whatever reason, but they weren't, com they didn't, weren't compelled to be to talk to us. Okay, well, fewer than 50% of officers responding raises concerns that the department has a broader cultural issue of reluctance to speak up. Um, are officers concerned that speaking with your office might lead to retaliation? They shouldn't uh, whatsoever. Which, uh, we always make sure that they have the understanding that they would be protected. And basically, and especially in this type of, uh, of a review, uh, we don't utilize their names in, in our report. It's just as an officer. And we don't even identify uh, where they're, whether it be Senate Division, House Division, or wherever. Okay. Well, well, thank you, sir. And thanks again for your work and the work of your entire team there at the IG's office. Uh, Mr. Schumann, thanks for joining us here today, especially on such short notice. Uh, as you're aware, we're here to discuss the oversight of the Capitol Police. We also know that the Inspector General's role is limited to only Capitol Police. As he mentioned repeatedly during our hearings last year, he does not have oversight authority of the Capitol Police Board. The Capitol Police Board, as you mentioned and as we mentioned, is made up of three political appointees and the chief of police is an ex officio member. The board holds an unusual amount of responsibility for campus security decisions. Can you help us to understand why this structure hinders transparency? Go a little bit beyond your opening comments. Well, sure. So there, there are a number of factors, some of which are already in the record. Uh, one, of course, is people have a lot of confusion about who's actually making the decision. Is it the board? Is it the chief? Sometimes the chief is in the board meetings as an ex officio member. There is not the release of the minutes of the proceedings before the board. The GAO has indicated that um, uh, folks who served on the Capitol Police Board and the Capitol Police Chief are confused about who they report to, who their overseers are, uh, and that the staff for uh, the relevant committees of jurisdiction uh, didn't feel like they were being kept in the loop with respect to decisions being made by the Capitol Police Board. Uh, the, ar the architect of the Capitol um, uh, in his testimony, I think back in May, said that uh, there needs to be more transparency and accountability in the board, that things are overclassified, that they're, that they're not made available and conversations can't happen with other folks, including staff and elsewhere, that there's a lack of dedicated staff. Um, GAO has faulted the board for um, who has access to the board's manual procedures, that it wasn't routinely being provided uh, to members of the committees of jurisdiction. Uh, and ultimately, the Capitol Police and the Capitol Police Board are not taking Congress's direction. Congress has said uh, to the IG um, or requested of the IG that the report should be made publicly available and told the Capitol Police to create a FOIA-like process. Uh, there have been other directives regarding uh, arrest information. And the Capitol Police has not implemented those recommendations. All of this suggests that the Capitol Police is not able to listen in the way that it needs to to the directions coming from Congress. There are also other structural problems in the way that not all members of the Capitol Police Board adequately report uh, to all uh, members of Congress. We saw that uh, what I referenced before with respect to the Sergeant Arms of the Senate being unwilling to testify in person before the House. I could go on, but I don't want to take up all your time, so I'm happy to keep talking about this. Well, thank you. Uh, I, Madam Chair, I ask unanimous consent to insert into the record the 2017 GAO report on the Capitol Police Board. Without objection. Uh, Mr. Schumann, I, I, you know, I, I know you're familiar with this report, and just do you consider the Capitol Police Board to be accountable and transparent? I think we know your answer. No, not only are they not accountable and transparent, I think they are the least accountable and transparent body that I've ever run across in the federal government. I've worked a lot with the national intelligence agencies, so that says a lot. Well, I appreciate your, your uh, comments today. I know that I'm running out of time, so Madam Chair, I'm going to end by asking unanimous consent to insert into the record a Washington Monthly article written by Mr. Schumann and Amelia Strauss from January 9th, 2021, titled a, a Primer on the Capitol Police, what we know from two years of research. Without objection, that will be uh, entered into the record. And Thank you. I, I yield back and thanks to the witnesses.
gentleman yields back. Mr. Raskin is recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Bolton, uh, was the department able to provide documentation to you that personnel at the rank of sergeant through inspector and the civilians in a supporting role attended periodic in-service training coordinated by the Command Coordination Bureau as is required by a directive of the department? No, they, that was one of the issues that they could not provide us with the documentation on many of the training, and that will end up being uh, brought up again in our Training Services Bureau review, which you all will be getting sometime in mid-March. So who's been responsible for the training of the department's sworn and civilian personnel both before and after January 6th? Well, on paper, technically, that would be the chief's responsibility, obviously being the chief. Uh, but that would come under whoever is in charge of the Training Services Bureau. But again, my report or review is going to show you that it's so disconnected, there is no one source to track all this training and to make sure that it is being done. So just to follow through on that point, was it the Capitol Police Board that was ultimately responsible? Or would you say it was so fragmented and frag fractured that nobody was responsible? It's, it's fragment, but certainly it, it would be the chief of police, not the board, but it would certainly be the chief's responsibility to make sure that all training is being completed. Okay. In your review of the K-9 unit, you found that in uh, FY18 through 20, K-9 officers failed to complete either basic radiation pager training or the refresher radiation pager training. In 2019, 10 K-9 officers did not complete the radiation pager training, and one officer did not complete any training at all between FY18 and FY20. Does the failure to train K-9 officers affect the security of the Capitol complex, and how severely was that a factor on January 6th? I, I wouldn't say it was a factor on January 6th, but it certainly could be a factor on the overall security and posture for the Capitol and providing the security within the Capitol complex. We can't make the link saying that that was a factor in January 6th, but certainly as the overall day-to-day -day operations, it can become a factor. Who's ultimately responsible for making sure that the mandatory K-9 training takes place? Ultimately, again, it would come down to being the chief as the head of the agency, it would be ultimately his responsibility. Uh, you found that the monthly 16 hours of maintenance training required for K-9 officers was not being completed Specifically, you found that, quote, none of the K-9 officers had completed all 16 hours of monthly maintenance training during the sample month of December 2020. Could this failure to train result in a K-9 unit failing to be able to detect a possible IED or other hazardous material being brought onto the Capitol complex? It certainly could uh, provide that uh, vulnerability, uh, not being able to properly detect that, those devices or even vapor weight dogs. So certainly it could degrade your uh, level of confidence. Okay, um, you also found the department's Dignitary Protection Division training program is self-managed and comprised of instructors with collateral duties as active DPD officers. What are the deficiencies and dangers of having a self-managed training program and how does that compare to the best practice standard? Best practice standard is completely separate and that it would that training would be conducted by uh, non operational individuals, although they have the subject matter expertise in it. But by allowing your own internal folks in the sense of operational one training can slip through because they have other duties that they're going to be completing. So training is not going to be a top priority for them completing because they're doing the other duties. And it doesn't allow for that separation of duties where you are assured that that training is being completed and is correct and is mission driven. Okay, now the big picture, Mr. Bolton, because all of us as members, and I think a lot of the staff know members of the Capitol Police Force, we are impressed by their heroism, uh, their sacrifice, both of which were demonstrated on January 6th when they literally put their lives on to save. Uh, put their lives on the line to save our lives, to save Congress, the vice president's life, the peaceful transfer of power, and yet there's a disconnect between their commitment and passion and 
uh, a number of these problems in the management of the force. How would you explain to somebody just looking at this from the outside what's gone wrong here? I think it goes back to initially when I, uh, my first hearing with, before this uh, committee is a cultural change where we need to quit thinking of ourselves as a police department that we're going out and policing, that we are a protective agency, that our number one duty and our mission in all training, no matter what it is, is going to be driven by that mission of protection. And that way, what little hours we get in training, because those are difficult, operational needs are extreme right now, but that training has to be mission-driven specifically. Thank you, I yield back, Madam Chair. Gentleman yields back, gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to start my questions uh, today with Mr. Schumann. And Mr. Schumann, I'm sure you're aware, as most everyone is, that one of our colleagues in the House of Representatives has raised serious concerns about Capitol Police officers recently improperly entering his office and taking photos of legislative planning material and then launching an investigation into his staff as a result of that. Now, this member is a former sheriff, and understanding he comes from the law enforcement community and being a, a sheriff, he would have an understanding of lawful and unlawful uh, search and seizure. He's also been an outspoken critic of the Capitol Police leadership. Now, while Mr. Bolton and his team are investigating this matter, this matter, can you describe for this committee some of the abnormal and unexpected behavior of security officials toward the Capitol Hill community? Thank you, sir. So I, I can't speak obviously to this particular matter, but there have been a number of other circumstances of, of unusual behavior by the Capitol Police. Um, for example, uh, in 2019, there was an officer who left his gun unattended in the men's room. This had happened uh, three times previously, I think in 2017. Uh, there was reporting of police officers shoving reporters in the Senate basement. Um, and also trying to stop reporters from talking to and walking alongside senators. Um, we, when in our research, we've identified, uh, so it's Inspector Bet General Bolton was talking to sort of a protective approach, um, like that, that newer model, but the Capitol Police spent a lot of time arresting people for things like smoking pot on their porch five blocks from the Capitol or going to Union Station and uh, helping to remove uh, unhoused people from Union Station which is not something that one would expect of, a, of the security force focused on protecting the Capitol. Uh, there was the incident two years ago, I think now, where there was, uh, they couldn't determine whether a plane was heading to the Capitol building and they kept everything on an orange lockdown or whatever the color is for a half an hour. Um, there were reports that the Capitol Police had killed reporters. And then of course, there have been more recent circumstances. I think one officer was, was accused of keeping a copy of the protocols of the elders of Zion at his post, which is an anti-Semitic track created by uh, Zarist Russians at the beginning of the last century. And of course, there was the, the police officer who recently tried to help one of the folks uh, involved in January 6th avoid arrest. These are all uh, inappropriate behaviors that we've seen from the Capitol Police that suggest significant problems inside. Now, in any of those instances, was there ever accountability for their actions? So in a couple of them, um, I, I believe that the, the officer who helped um, uh, uh, one, one of the people who attack, attacked on January 6th, like, I think he was fired. I think he was ultimately terminated. He may have just been suspended. Uh, I think there was a consequence for the person who had the protocols of the elders of Zion. In the other circumstances, we know that there were retaliation against officers who, for example, shared information about the um, uh, the police officer, one of the police officers left his gun in the men's room, um, but I am not aware of other steps that would be taken. Uh, that information is not routinely released to the public, so it is difficult to discern what, if any, remedial actions have occurred. I should add, though, that um, when you read the, um, um, uh, the ongoing litigation brought by Capitol Police officers, uh, and when you talk to the Capitol Police um, uh, union chief, they seem to suggest that there is a real distinction between the folks at the senior end of the leadership and the rank and file in terms of how they're treated and how discipline is meted out. It's difficult to discern what that looks like um, from, from where I said, unfortunately, without access to those records. So how can we better hold the Capitol Police leadership accountable in these type of situations or to assure they're not abusing their power like has been recently alleged? 
Well, I, so I think there's a couple things you could do. One is you can you can increase the oversight of the Capitol Police Inspector General and to make him and his office fully independent in all the ways that my written testimony describes that voluminous length that I'm sure was great fun to read. Uh, I would also suggest um, that the Capitol Police Board and the Capitol Police Chief structure don't make any sense. The lack of transparency and accountability to you, to the press, the public, to the people on Capitol Hill, uh, all indicate significant problems with the way things are managed. Uh, as far as we can tell, there seems to be kind of, you know, a, a network of a handful of folks at the top of the Capitol Police leadership who kind of protect each other. Uh, and this is something that we can't have if we want to protect the Congress. Um, I, I can, sorry, sorry I'll, I'll, please I'll let you go ahead. Okay. Um, one one last quick question. It may not be quick, but we'll answer however you can. But, you know, when it comes to January 6th, we have been told that the executive branch had sought to uh, get uh, certain data uh, from members of Congress, cell phone data, metadata, uh, et cetera. This is concerning as well. Um, and I think you've raised concerns about that data. Can you touch on those concerns here for the record? Yes, and, and I'll be brief in, in light of the time. Um, so to go and gather the information about members of Congress and other folks on Capitol Hill on January 6th, um, it, it seems likely that a warrant was applied for and obtained. Uh, the question that I have is how do they screen out the people who were not connected to this? Did they go and, and, and sort of do a, a dragnet look on a previous date as a way of filtering out these individuals? That is one possibility. Um, did they do so through a warrant? These folks were not connected to what went on. Uh, so there's questions about how that was done. Were they gathering cell phone and other uh, metadata about the individuals, the journalists, the visitors, the lobbyists, the family members, uh, and the members of Congress with their personal devices. How that was done, the mechanism that this filtering happened is concerning. Now, it could be that they purchased this information and basically did an end run around the Fourth Amendment, which is why there's legislation to address that sort of issue, but we can't tell. And we know there's a long history of the executive branch keeping an eye on the general public and members of Congress. We've seen, we saw that uh, uh, with the CIA and the torture memo on the Senate side. So it is concerning. Uh, more information needs to be disclosed here about what happened. All right. Thank you, Mr. Schumann. I'm out of time. Madam Chair, as I yield, I ask unanimous consent to insert in the record uh, a February 22, 2021 article from The Intercept titled FBI Sees Congressional Cell Phone Records Related to Capital Attack. Without objection, that will be entered into the record. Yeah, you'll back. Mr. Uh, Butterfield is now recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, for convening this very important hearing this afternoon, and thank you to the two witnesses for your testimony. It's good to see all of my colleagues today. I hope all of you are well. Uh, let me just, just continue with Mr. Schumann just for a second, if I can. Uh, Mr. Schumann, you may, may recall, you, you, you may know this, you may not know it, but prior to January 6th, there was erected down at Independence and Washington Street a huge tower. It looked like a some type of cellular tower. Are, are you familiar with that? Or is this information that you can share with us if you know what that tower was intended to do? No, sir, I don't know. All right. Well, let me stay uh, with the intelligence line of questioning. Uh, Mr. Bolton, What what is the importance of department personnel uh, understanding what intelligence is and how to act on information appropriately. In other words, what is the importance of, of understanding intelligence information? First and foremost, you need a well-trained uh, force to understand intelligence and to be able to compile that intelligence in order to look at your potential threat assessment. Given the fact that there are so many protectees, basically I'm gonna call all members, um, both on the House and Senate side as a protectee. Whenever you go off this campus, there is a gap in security because you're not going to have an individual uh, detail on, on you. So it's incumbent upon the Capitol Police to be able to reach out to their resources, whether it be local authorities, the local uh, congressional staff in that district, and try to be able to assess what is the threats out there. Generally, if you look at, especially with um, some of the recent ones, it would be the ball field shooting that Mr. Davis alluded to and the Arizona with Ms. Giffords, there were signs that were missed. Uh, there are social media signs that were missed that we could have, again, it's Monday morning quarterbacking, but those are the type of things that we need to be aware of in order to properly 
protect the members of Congress. Well, since January 6, has the department has the department initiated any intelligence training, even just basic intelligence training, to educate the sworn personnel? Uh, they have made they made strides. They have hired additional analysts. Some of them, are, I think, I believe, are still in training. They should be finished up this month. Um, they have been uh, conducting intelligence briefings more at the roll calls for the individual officers. So there is an educational process. I like to see more of it as far as teaching more in the basic school on what the officer should be looking for and to be able to understand what the intelligence means. What are the benefits of mandating personnel to be able to obtain and maintain a clearance from a security perspective? Well, first of all, what you're doing when you are making your force, I'm strictly talking about the Capitol Police, sworn and civilian. If you're sworn or with top secret clearance and your civilian with least minimum of secret, you are elevating and raising the bar of your expectation of your employees on and off duty. They recognize that you know, that they are certain expectations, whether it be here on campus, be, you have to be apolitical, on and off duty. This is simply as it is as a Capitol Police officer. It also provides a layer of protection against insider threat within the Capitol Police. Just recently, I think there was an article about a lieutenant within the Metropolitan Police or certain allegiance that are causing raising questions. So it's very important to have that, but also allows the officers to move about from one uh, position to another without having to, whether it be the SCIF or some other position within the Capitol Police, if everybody has a top secret clearance. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're back. I'm yields back. Mr. Stile is recognized. Thank you very much, Chair Lofgren. Uh, Speaker Pelosi has politicized and centralized control of the security in the United States Capitol. This can be seen through the implementation of fines for not wearing a mask on the House floor. It can be seen uh, through metal detectors to enter the House chamber. Uh, and it can be seen through the extended closure to the public of the United States Capitol and the People's House. And unfortunately, it appears that this trend of politicization is getting worse. This isn't about the rank and file members of the Capitol Police who we all support. This is about leadership. There's been a concerning reports from the Capitol Police Intelligence Division investigating members of the public who are meeting with their elected representatives. There's also allegations that USCP is even investigating a lawmaker and photographing their office. It was discussed earlier. Let me be clear. I support the men and women of the Capitol Police, but many are feeling that Speaker Pelosi is using the, the Capitol Police as just another political tool in Washington. We cannot let this stand. It cannot continue. Mr. Bolton, in Chief Manger's reply to my letter uh, regarding the published report about Capitol Police uh, reviewing citizens meeting with their members of Congress, uh, she requested you to investigate the reports, uh, in particular as it relates to the intel Intelligence Division. Uh, have you begun this investigation, and do you have any updates for us at this time? I uh, wouldn't feel, yes, we have begun. Um on both both counts of the, the open source um, review as well as uh, Congressman uh, Newell's uh, request. Uh, I can't give you an update at this time. It's ongoing, um, so I will hold any uh, information until we have completed our investigation, but we are, they are a top priority for my office, and we are working diligently to get those uh, reviews completed. I, I appreciate your efforts in this regards. Maybe you can answer this question. Let me break them down. One is it regards uh, the oversight of citizens meeting with their members of Congress. Are you receiving uh, full cooperate, cooperation or are you meeting any resistance? I'm receiving full cooperation from the department. Okay, and, and then as it relates uh, to the investigation of a member of Congress who uh, has alleged that individuals uh, from Capitol Police came in, photographed evidence, uh, that investigation you noted is ongoing. Uh, are you receiving any resistance during that investigation or is that, are you receiving cooperation? We're receiving full cooperation at this time. That's 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 positive to hear. I, along uh, with my colleagues, look forward uh, to reviewing your full report and hope that we're able to have uh, a hearing when those reports become uh, available. Let me continue with you, Mr. Bolton. Uh, one of the new policies put in place during the extended closure of the People's House, the United States Capitol, is that if a group of people or group of individuals want to meet with a lawmaker, the office has to send their names in ahead of time uh, so that they can enter the building. 
Uh, Mr. Bolton, in your opinion, is there a, a security purpose uh, or need for this type of closure? Well, it depends on what, what you're speaking. I think now that may be outside of my immediate purview that those names are being submitted to the House Sergeant of Arms. Uh, thing. So that's not within my purview of that. Uh, and that probably will be captured, or at least we'll have a better understanding to answer your question once we completed our review of the open source um, issue. So that Un right now, I wouldn't be able to answer that completely for you. Un understood. Mr. Schumann, do you believe that such a procedure uh, would actually chill speech uh, and limit individuals' opportunities to meet and speak with their member of Congress? Well, I th it sounds like the, the underlying question is whether the capital complex should be closed, which you're raising as a, is that, am I understanding you correctly, sir? Yes, and the, and the fact that for a, a, a citizen to meet with their member of Congress uh, in a congressional office, the, the name of that individual uh, needs to be submitted and recorded uh, by uh, capital security. Yeah, so I would suspect that probably has a chilling effect on some folks who would wish to come and meet in person in the Capitol Although there are alternate venues that are, are available uh, to do so, I so think that let me let me let me only because we're limited on time here, uh, Mr. Schumann. Let me let me continue with you. Uh, the, the sergeant at arms, uh, Mr. Walker, has mentioned in recent testimony that he's exploring implementing an insider threat program. Uh, are you aware of any similar type of program ever been implemented uh, before uh, in the United States Capitol? Not in the Capitol, no, sir. And, and are, are there particular concerns with such an implementation that you would have uh, in the United States Capitol, in particular in the legislative branch? Yes, if implemented badly, like we like we saw, for example, recently with the Department of Commerce, uh, an insider threat program uh, could uh, basically spin out of control. The, the concern. So, so I, I appreciate your concern. You, you highlight my concern. So, Madam Chair, here's my concern: the security apparatus, of the United States Capitol, I think, is continuing to be politicized. Uh, by Speaker Pelosi. There's a lot of questions. We're having a good conversation here. All of us support the men and women of the Capitol Police, uh, but we're challenged by some of the leadership decisions uh, we're seeing here in the United States Capitol. Appreciate you holding today's hearing. I hope we have more of these in the near future. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Aguilar is recognized. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thanks to our witnesses for, for being here and for participating. Uh, let me try to get, you're, you're being asked a lot of questions. Uh, outside of your uh, outside of your topic, Mr. Bolton, um, uh, let me try to get us back on topic. Um, you you talk about in your testimony the 104 you know recommendations uh, that uh, that you provided and and where they are within the queue. You know specifically, I guess you know from a from a top level, what's needed to implement those recommendations? Do we need more time? Do we need more leadership? Do we need a change in policy direction? You know, what, what do you feel to go from, from 30 to 50, from 50 to 70, you know, ultimately to get to all 109 recommendations, what's going to be the most effective tool that we can use? Now, some of the recommendations are long-term. Um, for instance, training. It, what we're recommending and what you'll see in our uh, subsequent report is that an investment in training. It, it's going to be a large investment. It's going to take the committee's appropriations and also a will for the department to make this type of change. Uh, some of the changes we could still be making now, like I said, in the cultural change, focusing on the type of training that we can do now, we need a system, and we're gonna recommend some of these, that any and all training has got to be mission directive. It's gotta be set forth of why you're doing that training. In other words, you have a lesson plan, you have objectives, and you have your expected results or outcomes for that training. We just don't do training for the sake of saying, oh, we're doing training. We also need to make sure that training is a continuous form. In other words, we're just gonna satisfy the IG and the committee and we're gonna conduct this training X and as soon as everybody's happy with that, then we're gonna go back to not doing the training. So we gotta make sure we put into place the policies, procedures, the continuing business practice of conducting that training and making these other cha changes that are going to be different. Some are long-term, some are short-term, but the department is making some strides um, and they have formed some committees uh, within the working groups, I should call them working groups to address these the recommendations. Do those working groups have deliverables, timetables, uh, milestones that, that, they, that they're under? 
And that would be uh, something that you'd have to ask the chief. I don't set. The, I wouldn't be able to set those timetables for them. It's it's really whatever the chief has set for those folks. It, you talked about the chief ultimately being being responsible. The training bureau underneath underneath the chief. Um, it seems like within the training category, the most basic thing you you can you can do is to just track who is being trained in what, and and you note that that there are some deficiencies there specifically did you identify a critical deficiency uh, with the department failing to have a mandatory leadership and development training program well incidentally we, um, some of the portion we've also uh, entered into uh, a review of career progression and rotational policy for the department so we'll, we'll be having that uh, report to you forthcoming as well within the next month or so so we are looking into that career progression that has been an issue at least what we felt that you did, you're not training your future leaders. And part of that is not having a rotational policy that is basically non existent within this department. And we are going to be recommending that they do have a rotational policy. Can you talk a little bit more about what that, what that would look like? What do you, what do you, what do you mean by rotational policy? Whenever you're in any of these special units, whether it be canine, CERT, DPD, Dignitary protective division. You cannot have an individual officer spending 15 years out of their 18 years in that particular field. You're doing a disservice to the officer and you're doing a disservice to the department as a whole, which is the most important thing is what is best for the department. You need to have that skill set that they have enhanced training, whether it be CERT, K9, DPD. Back into the field, one, you have a more experienced, a more a higher trained level individual back into the field, and you're giving your opportunity for your younger uh, officers to have that opportunity to get into that specialized training. So now you're building a leadership that they have these different skills throughout the department. You need, they can't spend their entire career sitting in the skip or in the House division or in the Senate division. You need to have a mandatory training that the department can come up with four years, five years, whatever. Uh, they can model after certain other federal agencies where you're given one dog. And once that dog is retired, then you're moved out of that canine section and another individual will take your place and get that kind of training. So you're building your leaders as well, because they have that knowledge, skills, and abilities. The, the, the balance to that is not losing that institutional knowledge, right? So, so build, having a good framework, having a good program, moving people through to experience different skill sets while having that, that institutional knowledge to make the, the, the group run. Um, because the downside is if someone just walks into a system and it's a, and it's a, broken, uh, a broken unit, uh, that doesn't do them uh, uh, service as well. So I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for the conversation, uh, Director Bolton, and, and we look forward to, to continuing to read those reports. Yield back, Madam Chair. Uh, gentleman yields back. Ms. Scanlon is recognized. Thank you, Chairwoman Lofgren. You know, throughout our oversight series here with the IG's investigation, we've had a number of specific disturbing trends that have been identified. Lack of training, inadequate resources, planning and leadership, absence of clear communication by that leadership to rank and file officers. They're all deeply troubling patterns that seem to impact most of the department's agencies and divisions. Most worrying to me is the lack of an acceptable, centralized and dedicated plan for the January 6 events and the absence of a process for developing similar plans for future events. And it's particularly concerning with some of our Republican colleagues continuing to embrace falsehoods and conspiracy theories to cast doubt on the legitimacy of the 2020 election and other such colleagues encouraging far-right extremists to bring more anti-government protests to the Capitol. So it's obvious that the Capitol Police have to have the capacity to prepare and execute plans of action to meet ongoing threats of violence and disruption of government functions on or near the Capitol co complex. So, um, Inspector General Bolton, I found your July 30th report very troubling with respect to what appeared to be gross deficiencies in command and coordination, which seriously impacted the ability of the Capitol Police to plan for and meet large scale events. Can you provide us with a you know, kind of state of today assessment of whether that ability has improved and what are the most important tasks that need to be accomplished to meet the next large event challenge? 
I think if we look at the uh, two most recent um, large scale events that the Capitol Police um, encountered. Uh, the, the previous one that happened in September, they were very well planned. Uh, and as you probably have read, they did go out and hire a subject matter expert uh, that was very well trained and versed in uh, large event planning. And that you saw the big difference by the planning with the other, our federal law enforcement partners, as well as our local and state, as well as also with the National Guard. So you, we have seen that, and it has happened twice now where they've had large events and they have gone on and they, they have shown uh, their ability to be able to plan for those large events. Uh, the only thing I would you know, caution is let's make sure it, it doesn't go by the wayside. It, it's, it continues, like I, I say before, and it's, it's people are probably tired of me hearing or hearing me say it, a continuous business practice. It's just regardless of who's the chief, regardless of who's the deputy chief, these are the steps that we are going to take. If we lose the individual that they hired and he or she decides to retire, the next person can step right into their shoes and continue on with the process. So we're not reinventing the wheel. And again, that kind of goes back to having that cultural change and having a strong foundation of training, a training services bureau that is strong. And basically, I have said before, that's your train and they're pulling the department along. So as long as you have a strong training, that's your foundation and your, your main engine train, it's going to pull the department along and keep them up to date and keep them moving forward. Okay, I just wanted to inquire a little bit into your um, report on dignitary protection and human capital. And you quite rightly noted that um, the folks who were on the floor in the Capitol, you know, despite the lack of resources and training, et cetera, really just performed heroically. I wasn't there in the Capitol that day. I was in my office across the street. Who's responsible for um, ensuring protection of the officers across the street? Is that the dignitary and um, protection division or is that someone else? If it's in your office, unless you actually have a detail on it, that's going to be the individual officers that are signed to that building, whether you're here at Longworth or the other cannon or any other. Those those are the officers. Um, they, and also, they should be incorporating, making sure your staff and yourself know in case of emergency where you're going to do and communicate. Well, maybe you just need to stay in place, shelter in place at that. But there needs to be that communication with the individual officers that, that are assigned to that particular building. Okay. Um, you know, we had a little bit of a flip on this conversation, you know, some criticism about the practice of identifying um, visitors to the Capitol. Do you know you've been with the Secret Service, right? Are visitors to the White House identified? Well, that's, it, it, you know, coming from the Secret Service, yes. It, it, the okay. Secret Service does a complete background check and everything before that someone comes to visit. And in, in fact, that's in a way to chill those who might want to visit for violence or other nefarious purposes, right? Well, it's make sure we know exactly who's coming to visit uh, the president or vice president that we are aware. It's, it's you can also know it's sometimes it's situational awareness as well. I, I'd submit that it's basically the practice in every major office building in this country at this point. So I, I don't see a problem with us having to identify who comes into uh, congressional offices. Um, I see my time has expired. I would yield back. Thank you. Gentlelady from New Mexico is recognized. Thank you very much, Chair Lofgren. And once again, thank you for holding this important hearing. And Inspector General, it's nice to see you again. Um, you noted that the department has only closed. Uh, your written testimony was 39 of the Inspector General's recommendations, and you said they've, they've uh, closed uh, some additional ones. But of the outstanding recommendations, um, what do you believe is among the most critical and urgent? Well, that's a tough one. Uh, um, they're all critical in a sense. Um, I, I think it's the moving, uh, beefing up our intelligence capabilities, having a solid training services bureau, uh, and it also is that cultural change. Uh, those are the important things. I, although you will say, well, I didn't see the word cultural change in any recommendation, but it, I think the recommendations, if you look at them as a whole, you will see us pushing the department into that direction. 
Yeah. Right, because it's like as as everybody as as we've heard from the questioning as as they move forward in terms of understanding the roles everybody else is playing as they understand uh, move from one position to another and therefore understand that they're all working together on on this uh, for, for the security of of the capital. Um, so it's been you know over a year since that harrowing attack on our capital by Trump supporters seeking to stop the constitutional counting of the electoral college votes. Um, and you discussed earlier that there was good planning by the Capitol Police for a large event last fall. Um, at this moment, though, are you confident that the Capitol Police is prepared for an attack? Similar to what happened on January 6th, uh, is the planning sufficient at this time? And if not, what must we do to get there? I believe your planning is sufficient at this time. There are so many factors in uh, what could or couldn't happen um, in that. But right now, you, you feel confident in that at least they got the planning down. Uh, mm -hmm. They had enough resources in uh, the last couple of uh, large events uh, that they, they've been able to handle. So, again, it's they are moving forward um so i'm confident at least in their planning stages and operational plans and getting the word out to their officers they're they are in a much better position than they were uh over a year ago well i'm glad to hear this progress even though it's clear that there is so much more work that we need to do mr schumann i really appreciated your remarks about the importance of public access at the capitol you know, one of the things that makes the legislative branch special is that we are always accessible, must be accessible to our constituents and the public. Um, but as noted earlier, there are things that don't necessarily stop us being accessible because um, uh, we could always meet elsewhere and, you know, identifying who you're meeting with is 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 as noted something that is done in almost every building you go into uh, after 9-11. But I wanted to follow up on your recommendation about making the Capitol Police uh, OIG independent of the board. Are there other authorities Congress should provide to the Inspector General to increase its effectiveness? That's an excellent question. Uh, so certainly independence. Um, uh, the ability to uh, get answers from the Capitol Police Board and to inquire into its records would probably be something that would make a lot of sense. Uh, there's probably a number of uh, documents that the Capitol Police, the Capitol Police Board routinely manage that the IG can get uh, if requested, but there may be value in having them routinely made available uh, to facilitate access. Uh, I would have to think more on it, but, but those, that's where I would start. Right, and if documents are being provided on a regular basis, then there is an understanding that there is going to be a review and that itself might, might, might improve. If I have time, I wanted to quickly go back to you, uh, General Bolton. In one of the interviews uh, on regarding command and coordination, one of the officers said, everyone forgot how to do their job. We should look at our leaders. Do they have the skill set? And if they don't have it, they need to go get it. Did your uh, review identify a department-wide codified leadership training and development program that they are getting now? Or is that one of the, the uh, recommendations that still needs to be worked on, the important recommendations? I think that's one of the things that they're still working on. Um, I'll have, uh, we're actually going back, and as I mentioned earlier, that we're doing a career progression and rotational policy review. And we should, we're just about wrapping that up ourselves. So we'll be able to issue that report soon. That'll answer more of your questions, but they still have work to do in that prog career progression and training their future leaders. Well, thank you, um, Madam Chair. My time is up and I yield back. Uh, General Lady yields back and I'll recognize myself for just some uh, final questions. First, I wanted to just note um, the uh, comments made by some members that the Capitol Police had broken into Congressman Nell's office. Uh, this allegation, there's nothing more serious than an allegation like that. Any member of Congress would be very concerned. I should note for the record, the police chief has denied it. And I wanna um, reassure myself, Mr. Bolton, that you're investigating this so we can make sure that we know the truth of what happened. Is that correct? That's correct, yes, ma'am. Okay, good. And we will look forward to that report. In terms of the uh, insider threat program that's been mentioned, um, I, in January, the uh, House Sergeant at Arms testified 
before the Ledge Branch Committee on Appropriations <clears throat> that the insider threat program was really for the House Sergeant at Arms office, not for congressional community at large, not members or um, and but I understand you're taking a look at this as well. Is that correct, Mr. Bolton? Not as a relation to the House Sergeant of Arms. Uh, our focus is on the open source issue of utilizing any type of uh, data banks or okay. um, the like of those things, but nothing as far as not, not with this, um, the House Sergeant of Arms and his uh, th inside a threat program, which would be for his staff only. All right. Um, we will look forward to that report as well. I just wanted to note in terms of the um, house buildings being open, one of the issues that we have not mentioned, which is, is the pandemic. And throughout this entire pandemic, the house has 100% followed the guidance of the attending physician. And we continue to do so today. And that is, um, an important element of what is going on here. Now, I have just a couple of quick questions, if I may. Mr. Bolton, um, you've made a number of recommendations and you've done good, you're, you and your team have done good work, absolutely. But not all of them have been implemented. And my question for you is, I, I'm sure you're talking to the chief, uh, doing assessments on where they are and the like. Have have these recommendations not been uh, accomplished because the chief disagrees with them, because they don't have resources, or because they just haven't gotten them done yet? What's your judgment? I, I think it's a variety of reasons. Some are obviously some of our recommendations do require uh, additional resources, whether it be uh, manpower or uh, additional appropriated funds. Uh, so there is those, those are what I would classify as the long-term uh, recommendations. There are a few uh, recommendations that I think the, ch the chief and I are in discussions that uh, he may not totally agree upon. Um, we continue, we have met twice since um, uh, early this year. Uh, so we continue to uh, go through a dialogue. So we have an open dialogue and to work through those recommendations that they either have questions about or not quite uh, fully understanding uh, where we're trying to get to. Uh, so there's a variety of reasons for that, but they are uh, at least working towards getting those recommendations closed. Okay. Now, the department has uh, stated publicly that it has changed the way it processes intelligence. Um, and for example, they've grown their intelligence staff from 14 to 32. They now require all staff to get and maintain top secret clearance. They've implemented new performance standards for intelligence analysts, new training, reorganized the command structure, um, addressed increased threats to members by additional um, uh, protection at offsite uh, uh, sites where members are frequently present uh, during um, sessions. On the other hand, they have yet to fill the intelligence in interagency coordination division directors uh, position with a, a qualified uh, individuals. You say um, that we have 34 recommendations outlining deficiencies. How do those recommendations relate to what they've already accomplished? Uh, some, like I said, uh, we, uh, some of the recommendations that we did make is that hiring additional analysts. Uh, getting those analysts trained and continuous training. They have implemented that. They have put those, uh, they have updated their policies and procedures. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, I'm hoping that they do hire a director here soon. Um, I also, one of our recommendations was, it has been implemented, was moving uh, intelligence into a division level as opposed to the current bureau level. We wanna see it as a standalone uh, within the department and elevate it to a higher level than what it is currently now. Okay. You know, um, Mr. Bolton and, Ms., and Mr. Um, uh, Schumer, I uh, really appreciate your testimony today. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this hearing, we are going to keep <clears throat> this record open 
uh, so that members may have additional questions, they're going to direct them to you. And we would ask that in that case, um, you give us your answers as soon as you possibly can. I would note, uh, Mr. Schumann, that um, it's been helpful to get your testimony. We've thought a lot uh, about how to structure governance of the Capitol Police. We've had our GAO uh, report, but uh, obviously it takes consensus between the House and Senate. Um, you know, the I think the board structure was, it's been in place for quite some time. It was intended to prevent, you know, the politicization of a Capitol Police, which is, you know, an admirable goal, and yet has resulted in something that is not particularly accountable to the public. So your thoughts and comments are greatly appreciated, as is our Inspector General, who's always welcome here. I do, uh, I would like to thank the witnesses and, um, well, as I say, we will keep the hearing record open. And uh, as we have all had a chance to ask our questions, this hearing will now be uh, adjourned with thanks to all the members and witnesses.